Good morning. Uh, before we get started, let me just uh, make a, uh, just a neat announcement. Uh, this, uh, well, it's already happened, but it, in Australia, when it was uh, Sunday uh, night, uh, the first service of the renovation, uh, Regeneration Baptist Church Evening Church has started. Um, Paul McIntosh is the pastor of the Evening Church of the Rene 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 Regeneration Church. We got Renovation Church, we got Regeneration Church. Anyway, but um, uh, we set out to send flowers to the service, and uh, I. We didn't know how to send them, and they didn't know how to get them, so that had to pass by. But uh, uh, Paul and Sharon, uh, they have a group from uh, the Monash University um, and a number of those students, and they are making up the collection of people who are uh, the uh, renovation, uh, the regeneration um, uh, church, evening church. And uh, so we give the glory to God for that. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, um, thank you that we can stand before you and worship you. Father, indeed, I pray that we would worship you. Um, Father, even as the song has, has mentioned and the psalmist has said, um, who on earth, uh, who in heaven do we have besides thee? There is none on earth that I desire Father, we pray that that would truly be our, um, the cry of our heart this morning, that, Lord, our hearts would be turned to you. Lord, may we, for this time, take our eyes completely off of ourselves. And, Lord, may we worship you through this service. Thank you um, for the privilege of being here. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> John the Baptist, um, the baptizer. Apparently he was north of uh, Jerusalem and he was in the area of Samaria. He was baptizing in a, in a, a service and uh, following the baptism he was apparently on his way coming down toward Jerusalem when he met some disciples of his who had witnessed a baptism uh, done by Jesus. And as they came to him, they said, John, um, there's another who is baptizing the same way you baptize. It was almost there was an air of jealousy there. That's when John said, no man can do anything except God teaches him or God gives it to him. He said, Christ is the Messiah. I am not the Messiah. He is from heaven. I am from earth. He must increase, and I must decrease. I think as I go through my Christian life, that if I started every day focusing on increasing God, I would be much more apt to decrease myself. If we could maintain a right view of God and of Christ, we would realize that we stand in a great privilege of grace every day. And in that position, we should not at all once complain and be selfish. Lessons for the 
children of God. You know, we are all children. The Lord looked at his disciples and he said, except you be converted and become as little children, you will never see the kingdom of heaven. Their heart was very much on the kingdom of heaven. They wanted so much to be there. In fact, there was kind of a vying for power. Who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven? It's there that Christ said, except you become as little children. Now, in one sense, we are all little children very much. We're like toddlers. In fact, I understand the scripture says um, that in, in this way of talking about a child, uh, John MacArthur says he was talking about a toddler. Um, uh, uh, the peavies, they'll go down and teach the toddlers. Um, and uh, uh, Veronica teaches for, uh, uh, that's her job, teaching toddlers. I bet they could uh, tell us all about the toddlers. The nature of toddlers they are very selfish. They are very self-centered. They are very um, uh, uh, covetousness. They are very, um, uh, whatever they see, they want. And they want it now. If you've got a, a bunch of toys and one child can sit there and he can not have interest in any of them, have another kid come in and they play with that toy, all of a sudden that toy just becomes uh, uh, like magic. It's my toy. I want it too. You're having fun with that. I want that experience too. Give it to me. And sure enough, we know that um, toddlers can become very violent. Um, there's times you become like a policeman. And uh, in fact, uh, years ago, there was a policeman that said, uh, every, every child has this nature that if it's not tamed, they will grow up to be the most uh, heinous criminals uh, ever because that's the part of our nature. Um, We're like selfish children. And yet as Christ was speaking to the disciples, apparently he had already been speaking to uh, a crowd. There were some people there, and uh, probably there were some parents there. And the Lord singled out a little toddler, and I'm sure he called him by name, probably never met him before, but could call him by name. If he could call Nathaniel uh, by name, he could call this child by name. And this little toddler comes walking out, and what child would not want to come in front of a crowd? Uh, just like a, at a demonstration, everybody wants to, can I, can I be the one for the demonstration? Came, and this child comes up. And Christ takes this child, he's sitting down probably, and puts this child in his lap. And he says, except you be converted and become like little children, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Mark, what did you mean? Children. Children. Children are helpless and they're dependent totally upon their parents. You know, Ezekiel uh, gave an illustration, and he was um, trying to explain uh, to um, uh, Jerusalem and the, 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 um, uh, the people of, of that time, saying, look, um, you are like little children. And he said, let me give you this illustration. He said, There was a man, he was a rich man, and he was a very benevolent, benevolent man, and he was walking in the field at one day, and he came upon a newborn baby girl, and she was in the weeds. Her heritage was 
two different races. Apparently, she was a half-breed, and no one wanted her. The mother knew this, and the mother didn't want her. And there she lay in the blood of her afterbirth with the umbilical cord still on her. And the scripture says that this man took this baby and washed her and coddled her and fed her and dressed her. And through the years, she became to be a very beautiful woman, and he put jewels upon her, and she would have made uh, a tremendous bride for any man. But can I tell you, that's exactly what God did to us when he saved us. Except you be converted. Converted. It's interesting. Um, the word actually means to turn from the way you're going and to pursue a different direction. It means repent. It means when you look at your life and your sin, you look at it and you're disappointed, disgusted. You realize it's a part of you, but you don't want to tell any about, anybody about it. It's some secrets in your heart and you know how bad you feel. The Lord says he applies the law to us as we look at our sin and the, what the law does is says this is what God expects but this is what you've done. This is what you shouldn't do, but this is what you did. And the law applies that our sin would become exceedingly sinful. And it's that point at which you begin to look and you say, oh, I, I, I want to be rid of this sin. I'm ashamed of this sin. I don't know how to... I don't know how to reform. I don't know how to get rid of it. And if you know God's grace, and if his grace has shined upon you, the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ then shines on you. And in your darkness, you look and you see the light, and the Lord says, I will take your sin. I will be your savior. I have died for you. I will give you righteousness. I will pick you up out of the mud. I will wash you off. I will clothe you in my righteousness. You will become a part of my family. And I will love you forever and I will make you a part of my kingdom. Thank God for his grace. Become as little children. You know, it's interesting. You think of a toddler, and they're so needy. In their heart, they know that they cannot exist without the parent. They know that there's no protection, there's no feeding, there's no cleaning, there's nothing they can do. You set a toddler out into the forest and they will die because no one will take care of them. They are very needy. And yet it's interesting that in their heart, Sometimes they become so selfish. And in one way, it's like they, they want what they want, and somehow they lose what the parent has done for them, and a child may become rebellious. A child may hit the parent. The child may misbehave. And yet in their heart, they know that they are dependent upon him. And the scripture says, 
except you become as little children. It's interesting that uh, um, the disciples, their attention was on who is the greatest. Now, it's interesting. The scripture says at the same, at the same time came the disciples. At the same time. What happened at the same time? When you go back and you read where the Lord has given, repeated something that he said to them that they really didn't understand. He said, once you understand something, that men are going to be, betray me and they are going to kill me. And I'm going to stay dead for three days and then I'm going to be resurrected. He told Peter that. He told the disciples that. And it was a, it, the scripture says, it was a solemn moment. Right after that, the Pharisees came and they said, we need to, you guys need to pay your taxes. And uh, uh, Jesus said, well, let's go fishing. And they went fishing. They found taxes, uh, the tax money in a, inside a fish. Um, and they th thought, this is great following Jesus. And wait till the kingdom comes. And you know, when the kingdom's established, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They did not recognize the grace that had given them, been given them. They didn't recognize that as the Savior had said this, soon he would actually go through the, the, uh, uh, the midnight trials and he would go to the cross. And those words would resound back in their mind. Who's the greatest? Who cares who's the greatest? Our Lord is upon the cross. That's all that matters. Oh, listen. If we could somehow peel back our blindness and see God's grace that's ever extended to us, we would be so thankful, but we would be so humble. We would not want to turn to anything for ourselves. It's just, Lord, I'm just, I'm just honored to just be a part of your family at all. Just make me a gatekeeper in the house of the Lord. That's all I want to be. Don't give me anything else. You know, it's interesting. If you follow up Ezekiel 16, this young lady that was so beautiful, she was so decked in jewels, she had so much privilege. Yet this young lady came to dress herself so fine and offer herself to several lovers. She took the jewels that uh, were hers and she shaped these into a, an idol. And she became a prostitute. In fact, she even paid people to see her. That's how far God's people had fallen. She didn't realize the grace that was given to her. It's interesting, this same chapter... You go to the end of this chapter, it's about the man who was so uh, 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 wealthy, and yet he had an unrighteous servant. His unrighteous servant owed him thousands because he had cheated in the uh, office that he w had held, and he owed his uh, employer uh, thousands. And he says, just be patient with me. I'm going to pay you everything. Ridiculous. You couldn't have. And yet the master was moved with compassion and said, Sir, I will forgive you all. But then we realize that the, how this same servant went out and found someone, a co-worker, who owed him pennies, and he said, 
please forgive me. And he says, nothing doing. I will not forgive you. You have to pay what you owe or I'm going to send you to the tormentors. And we all look at that story and we say, what was wrong with this guy? The reason he was so demanding and unforgiving is because he didn't recognize the grace. Oh, Lord, make us recognize the grace. If we recognized your grace, we not, would not be so demanding of others. We would not be so critical of others. We would not be so selfish. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful. Boy, that's a, that's a heavy scripture, isn't it? When we knew God, we didn't glorify him as God. We weren't thankful. Our foolish heart was darkened. Professing ourselves to be wise, we become as fools. Don't offend the children. It's interesting, the disciples, they had said, who is going to be the greatest? You know, this is not the first time it came up. In Scripture, you see several times they grapple with this. In fact, if you read, you can see where um, the, the Lord at the Last Supper, that very night he was going to be betrayed. He had the Last Supper. And he had just said, somebody's going to betray me. And then the Lord looked over at the disciples and they were mumbling to each other. And he said, so what are you talking about? They were embarrassed. They were talking about who's the greatest in the kingdom. The Lord said, you know, you're going to offend some little children. When he says little children here, he's talking about any of God's children. They could be little children or they could be older children. But they're God's children. And in this case, here are these disciples. They were vying for some position. And the other disciples were looking at this. And some of them began to take sides, probably. And then there was some jealousy, thinking, well, he thinks he's in that position. What position am I going to have? And you can begin to see the posting. And you can see the prideful spirit. And you can see all kinds of carnality. And it's all produced by this evil heart that says, I want my position. I am not satisfied with where I am. I want to make sure I have good position when I get to the kingdom. And the Lord said, you are offending the little ones, the other Christians around you. Remember Asaph, Psalm 73? He was a guy that was a musician and he looked around and saw the wicked prosper. It's interesting, Jeremiah saw the same thing. We were in our Bible studies and we saw the same thing. And the Lord, he said, why do the wicked prosper? Well, Asaph said the same thing. And he says, uh, their children, they turn out right. They're calves. Uh, they, they all grow. They're, they're crops. They're, they're bountiful. And then he looked at me and says, why am I worshiping God? I'm going through the trials. My children are having a hard time. My crops aren't always so good. And I'm trying to walk with the Lord and look at these things that are happening to me. And the scripture says he almost lost his faith. And I tell you what, if you've had to personally grapple with that issue personally, you need God's grace or you will lose your faith. But you see, in that moment, it's interesting, in that moment, he said, then my heart was pricked. I was grieved in my heart because 
I might offend the children. If I talk this way, one of the others may hear my speech and it may destroy their faith. And God talked, Christ talked to the disciples and said, don't offend the children. Oh, listen. Don't let your liberty become a stumbling block to someone who is around you. It's important how we live. It's important how we talk. And it's important because we have influence. We all have influence. In fact, your influence may be much further reaching than people that you know and people that you see. But as you have your reputation, if it's a reputation of holiness, holiness, people will be drawn to him. They will see your good works and they will glorify your father, which is in heaven. But if indeed your testimony or your actions cancel that, others will be affected and they will also fall. Don't offend the children. Now, it's interesting, just a note uh, to parents, a message to parents. It's interesting, when, um, when sin becomes a family thing, it's interesting, uh, uh, Jeremiah 7, he was looking at the people that he um, uh, ministered to, and he says, it's interesting, he says, I see the children gathering wood. I see the father building a fire. I see the mother baking cakes. And it's all done to the queen of heaven. Their sin was a family thing. They all just uh, agreed to say, this is how we're going to do it. This is not necessarily the way God taught, but we're going to do it, and let's all get together. And you know what? How many parents have led their children straight to hell because they have not worshipped God? You know, the Scripture says, the Lord our God is one Lord. We need to worship him with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our might. And if we are parents, we need to teach that to our children, that if God is the main thing in our life, is he's a source of our life, if he really is our all in all, then we look at our children and we say, I want you to know God. I'm going to tell him about, I'm going to tell you about God when you rise up and when you're in the way and when you sit down and when you sleep. We're going to tell you about God. We're going to tell you about God. We're going to tell you about God. Oh, parents, don't tire ever about telling your children about God. We get so concerned about how they're going to socialize. We get concerned about uh, uh, the sports they play. We get concerned about the academics they have. We get co concerned about how they're going to fit in. Oh, listen, how are they going to fit in in the crowd of Jesus? That's what's important. You give a child a good foundation spiritually, and I guarantee you he'll figure out the rest. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will follow. You know, um, keep safe from the offenders. You know, we have noticed, and, and it's just been made aware this, this year, I mean, it's gone on for a lot of years, but this year we've become very, very aware through the different teachings uh, and the different court cases and different school uh, uh, policies that are going on. And we're realizing that there is a conscious uh, effort in the school system to uh, uh, make children ungodly. Make children ungodly. It's not enough to say, well, we're just going to take God out of the schools. 
No, we're going to purposely indoctrinate the children to uh, uh, hate the way that they're made, to question their race, and uh, to question what you've made, been made the wrong race, even to question their gender, you've been made the wrong gender, introducing them to things that they, they, they should never even consider as children. And yet that's being taught in the schools. And thank goodness for the parents that are rising up in arms and saying, we need to change the school board. We need to change the system. But listen, as a parent, we realize there's so much out there that is trying to tear our children down and make them to be secular and ungodly. Don't offend the children. Then there's a note here. A caution to each one of us. We need to police ourselves. Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. And if there's something in our way that is blocking our way to be holy for God, the Lord says, take some extreme measures. If you have an offending eye, pluck it out. If you have an offending hand, Cut it off. Certainly not literally. But the Lord was trying to give the message that if indeed there's something between you that is consciously blocking your worship with the Lord and his feeding of you, then you need to somehow get rid of that. <sighs> then the Lord looked. And he thought about those who had offended and those who had fallen in offense. And he said this, What man of you would be if you had a hundred sheep and one of them went astray? We've known those who've gone astray. Right now, some of you as parents know a child that's gone astray. You know, Jeremiah, he looked at his nation the reason I was so interested in Jeremiah, Jeremiah ministered the last 50 years before Jerusalem fell. And if you uh, look through those chapters, there's so much about uh, what happened in Jeremiah's day that it, it, it just uh, carbon copies what's happening in our day. And you read so many of those chapters, you said, that's just what I read on the internet. He told the nation, you're in sin. He named the sins that they're in. He looked at the troubles of the nation, and he says, don't look any further for the reason our nation is in the shape that it's in, except to look at your own sin and understand that God judges sin. And I would say the same thing to us today, that our country's in a mess, we're losing our freedoms, we're going to lose our country, and if you think it's good, uh, bad now, it is guaranteed to go worse. If you can't run with the footmen, you wait till the horses come and see what it's like. But Jeremiah denounced sin. He denounced the priests. He denounced the prophets. He didn't let anybody escape. He just kept saying, this is uh, uh, you're sinning against God. You would almost think that a prophet so hard and so stern that he only had a cold heart. But I want to tell you something. He said, yet he wept. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Here's this stern prophet 
had a, a forehead hard as nails because God said, when you start your ministry, people are going to hate you. They're going to hate you because you're going to speak for God. But as he preached his message, and as he saw the fallen, and as he said, listen, God is going to judge you. He is resolute in this. He will not repent. He is going to judge you. It's going to happen. There is no way out unless you repent. Oh, listen. Seek ye the kingdom of God. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him when he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and find mercy. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. For as high as the heaven is above the earth, so are my ways above your ways, and my thoughts above your thoughts. If we have a sheep that's gone astray, and he's out in the wild, and he's struggling, if he's left alone, he will just die. In obedience to the gospel, there is a time for discipline. And sometimes a person is disciplined and they're taken away from the church. God in his wisdom did so, not as a matter of banishing them to the outer darkness. He did so as a way of making them realize that they need to come back. Beloved, let our heart never ever grow cold towards sheep that is outside. In all the stern messages of the prophet, almost in every case, there's that caveat. But if you return unto the Lord, you can have hope. But let him who glories glory in this, that he knows and understands me, that I exercise mercy or loving kindness. I exercise loving kindness. When we think of God, we must think of the loving kindness of God, that he's forever with mercy. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so is his mercy toward them that fear him. For he hath not dealt with us according to our sins or rewarding us, rewarded us according to our trespasses. But he has dealt with us in loving kindness. He exercises loving kindness, but he also exercises justice. Every person needs to understand God is a just God. And the world says, I don't understand because here's the loving kindness of God and here's the justice of God. How in the world can they mix? I'll tell you how they mix. They mix in the next word. And he says, I exercise righteousness. You see, you can take 
the justice of God that condemns us and the loving kindness of God who forgives us. And in Christ, the two meet. And the Lord says, I took all the judgment and I will give you my mercy and I will make you righteous. And the whole deal is righteous before God. In these things I delight, saith the Lord. He must increase. I must decrease. Beloved, if you're struggling with anything in your life, especially if you know the Lord, the answer is here. He needs to increase. We need to decrease. He that is least here is greatest. Except you be converted to become as children. You're never going to see the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I pray that you would survey our hearts in this very private moment. Lord, you called us from being just like those toddlers. We had a nature that was just like that, selfish, covetous, mean, concerned only about ourselves. And yet, Lord, when you came to convert us, you taught us, Lord, that all of that past was sinful. Lord, as we confess those sins, those of us who believed in you, you made us righteous in you. Lord, we were converted from being children of wrath to become children of God. Lord, we stand here as part of the family of God. You have given us a special wisdom that we would understand the mysteries of grace. Oh, Father, so much our heart, as much as we see wrong, and we would, we would all agree and herald that, that sin is so wrong and, and, and is so evil. And Lord, we would look at our own besetting sin, and we would say how ugly it is. And yet, God, I don't understand it. How that there's a reservation in my heart that loves the thing that I hate, the thing that you hate. And there's a magnetism, there's a pull, there's something that will never go away, a, de a delight somehow in the things of this world. The selfishness, how I can be selfish, how I, I can... I can uh, uh, fulfill my own lusts, and enjoy it. Oh, God, help me to see more of you and less of me. God, as I gaze at your grace, I'm so embarrassed with my thought. Lord, as I look upon you, the depth of your love, the richness of your wellhouse of grace, so ashamed of my unthankfulness. Lord, may you increase and may we decrease. In Jesus' name. <laughs>
Thank you. 